Okay. Yes. Are we ready? That's it? Good. Um, welcome to Stralka. I guess it's also true for me because it's my first time here. Uh, my name is Thomas Leser. I'm coming. It's funny because I usually don't introduce myself. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, here for a reason which I'll, um, in Moscow, I'm, 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 I'm my office is in New York. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll tell at the end. I'll show you why I'm in, why I'm here. Um, I want to, I want to sort of give you an overview of some of the projects um, I've done in my office of, um, over the years, uh, with a little bit of focus on on um, projects in extreme climates. Um, We've done a few projects in, in Russia, one of which is in Siberia, and we've done a few projects uh, in tropical and desert climates, which we're working on right now. Um, and I will show a few projects sort of in between, uh, which highlight a little bit the kind of my interest in, in new technologies and its sort of um, possibilities for architecture and its inclusion in architecture and the kind of thinking of um, uh, architectural space as, as kind of a digitally pro programmable. Pro closer, closer, really loud, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, the thinking of architecture as a kind of programmable digital space um, and not so much as a kind of formal expression, as a kind of, but more as a kind of expression of uh, um, possibilities of how how space can respond or you be used through technology by by users. But let me start with this project. You, some of you may have seen this. This uh, was um, in the Venice Biennale in the Russian Pavilion. Um, so I was rep representing Russia in, 19, in in 2008. Uh, with this project was a competition that we won uh, uh, in um, an international competition. And this, the project is in Yakutsk, which I believe is about as far away from Moscow as New York is, is uh, from Moscow. Um, and whenever I have talked to people here in, in Moscow about Yakutsk, it was to, to them as foreign as it had been to me. Uh, I initially got interested in this project through my kids thinking a, a, a museum for a woolly mammoth, this is my, 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 my kids would like this. But then uh, I quickly realized it's actually not so much about the sort of, sort of you know, prehistoric animals, but it's, it is actually about climate change uh, and climate research. Uh, and I got fascinated ab um, about the, the uh, the kind of natural phenomena of permafrost and the, the, the kind of challenges to architecture. Uh, the landscape is really uh, quite amazing. Um, the fact that the, the ground constantly freezes and in, in summer the top surface uh, uh, melts and thaws, creates this really in incredible painterly uh, surface um, uh, and, and, um, and rivers that, that are sort of unmanageable in, in a way. Um, and the fact that the, the town, the city of Yakutsk is uh, permanently covered in snow, more or less, um, uh, and that to build in an environment like this uh, you know, poses incredible challenges architecturally, structurally. Um, so I was, was interested in the kind of design opportunities of, of such an environment. Um, you may possibly know that that uh, I, that you know it's sort of I think temperatures go to minus 50 degrees or something extreme cases um, uh, while in summer they go up to you know 40 degrees plus uh, supposedly I've this very it's kind of I'm sad to say I've never made it out there um, but supposedly when you take a cup of uh, hot water and throw it in the air, it sort of turns into instant ice, uh, kind of um, ice dust. Um, some buildings look like this. Uh, 
when when you don't heat them properly or when or when they may be overly insulated that could be another another possibility uh, transportation in winter takes place on the river um, what happens if your vehicle sort of breaks down uh, it's actually sort of life threatening in summer roads sort of look like this um, you know, so transportation is very difficult. It's easy to get stuck. This is sort of rush hour. Uh, so you, you know, so, so you know, after sort of looking a little bit into this environment, I was I was really fascinated about proposing a structure. But I also realized it was uh, it would be very difficult to actually build anything uh, in this. Uh, um, you know, in these difficult circumstances, and, and you know, if you, if you get stuck, I mean, what actually sort of happened, um, you know, if, or what will happen to you is this, um, that you end up in an ice block eventually and maybe be found 50,000 years later. Um, so this is the woolly mammoth that they found in, in, this, in the region of Siberia, which is currently stuck in an ice cave uh, where it's permanently of cold enough for it to not have to be artificially cooled. What's happening to the landscape is quite fascinating that the, 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 the fact of this freezing and thawing creates a kind of idealized pattern of, of a, a geometry um, that creates these sort of, uh, uh, this sort of irregular grid uh, of, of a landscape that eventually um, became a kind of strategy for designing this, the skin of the building um, uh, because we realized this geometry has to do with kind of optimizing connections between, between different kind of uh, uh, temperature zones in the material um, and we developed the idea of the, of the surface which I'll show in a minute. This is the actual site itself. Behind, behind the photographer here is a very steep mountain and we came up with a very simple strategy for designing this building. Um, you know, it's the first thing we did, we sort of looked at the overall program, and there's, this, there's two parts to it. There's a museum part to it and a, and a laboratory part to it. Uh, and the laboratory is what was in the program a little bit, um, sort of was kind of hidden in the program. What it really is, is a laboratory for, for uh, DNA research, um, and the attempt is to revive the woolly mammoth, to cross it with a kind of African elephant, and see whether it can be recreated, which is a kind of, I guess, a uh, Russian version of Jurassic Park. Um, so anyway, so we had this program of about 5,600 square meters, uh, and there's this mountain, so we, we pushed the program into the mountain because the mountain is where the mammoth is, is sort of stored, in which the idea is that this this cave uh, would become part of the museum. Um, so, we, so, so the geometry of this program got de uh, deformed by this, by this idea of this hill. Uh, we then sort of uh, folded the upper surface to, to facilitate you know, runoff of ice and water and snow. Uh, and we deformed the underside to indicate where the entrance is. And this was kind of the very simple four-point strategy. Um, this is the side plan, which is based on this, on this permafrost pattern, which uh, became a model for the overall geometry. And, but it also you know, looked a little bit into the kind of science of this geometry, uh, and, and which we discovered is it's actually a, an amorphous carbon structure um, which is the it's the molecular st uh, structure of what is what is it's a material that's called aerogel, which is the most insulating material known to man by the factor of ten, um, uh, which is what we thought would be a, the perfect material to cover the building with. So, th so here you see this kind of three-dimensional stru uh, uh, structure, which is which is technically is called the Voronoi pattern, and this is the kind of general volume of the of the of the museum which we then decided, even though in the competition it said like one should have very few windows because of the, the uh, heat loss. Um, but with this idea of this aerogel material, we thought it would be best to make the entire building basically a window and fill, so you know, have a, so basically make a glass window and fill it with aerogel, which would be the you know, 
best insulated building one 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 could um, one could build. So then the next question was, how do you build on this on this permanently f freezing and thawing ground? And obviously, you lift the building up and you have as as little points of connection to the ground as possible, um, which which created these kind of legs uh, on on top of which this this museum volume would be sitting. The 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 kind of this is optimized uh, geometry of the skin, and then of course sort of additional light wells because it's uh, you know light is also fairly uh, um, difficult to come by uh, in in winter in that region. Um, so we wanted these sort of uh, special li light light wells, uh, even though the building itself would glow through this aerogel filled. Uh, glass panels. So this is more or less what the, what the geometry looks like. The foundations, uh, you know, go through the same process again here. Um, and this is the interior structure, which is this, this uh, uh, carbon model of a 3D Voronoi pattern. Um, and this is what, what this would look like. Um, so this would support that sort of translucent skin and kind of a three-dimensional irregular grid, uh, and and here you know it's again a sort of build up. This is the woolly mammoth sitting in this mountain cave. Um, we as a, as an entrance plaza, we 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 because everything should really be floating. Uh, we provided this floating metal grill, uh, and through which only the foundations would would go into the ground, and the foundations would be cooled in order to prevent any kind of heat transfer into the ground, which would of course make the building otherwise sink. Uh, even elevators and escalators would be floating above the ground, and then you'd have the, um, the covered columns uh, and the eventually the surface that contains the program. So the first level would be um, a mechanical space, and then you would come to the laboratory level, uh, then to the museum level, and some administrative uh, uh, spaces above, and, and again the enclosure of the building. So in, in section, you can see how the uh, escalator rides through the mechanical space and then primarily, most important, through the laboratory because what we wanted to um, foreground is precisely what was a sort of like little bit buried in the, in the program is this laboratory where, where the actual really real work of this museum would take place, um, you know, where the, where the kind of Frankensteinian experiments may be undertaken. So you you ride as a visitor you ride on the on the um, escalator through the laboratories you can't get off there, but you see that there's something happening there's a sort of an underworld to the to the museum world above so here you see the the kind of we made the scientists look a little bit like saints, um, which is of course a tongue in cheek joke. Uh, they they have access to these gardens which is then from uh, from the museum level above. You can look down, and um, uh, you see this sort of like translucent skin of the facade and the structure of the woolly mammoth. So this is what it looks like in summer. These interior gardens we thought were important because um, the summers are very short, even though they're very hot, but they're very short. Uh, Yakutsk is the is the is a city with the most extreme temperature difference between summer and winter. Um, uh, and it's the coldest inhabited place on earth. So this was sort of um, um, for us the, the kind of interest in this project. Um, the fact that it, some people think it looks like a woolly mammoth is sort of like coincidental, um, but uh, it's sort of like a good way of looking at it. So here's the model that we had presented at the Biennale in 2008. Okay, um, I want to show another project we did in, in Moscow here uh, a few years ago, which unfortunately got stopped by the economic crisis. Um, we were asked to do a school, um, a school for uh, basically uh, a nursery, primary school, middle high school, um, and kind of rec recreational facilities for the schools together. Uh, and the the uh, our client, um, it's very funny. The, the, the school was so supposed to build in stages because the, our clients, our children were were sort of about to be entered in nursery school, and then they would you know 
find what builds every school according to his kids, you know, the age, how they, it's a very funny way of, of looking at things. But um, so the school, what we thought um, it would be this kind of flexible uh, entity that um, could grow with the different, uh, uh, you know, the different um, age groups, so to speak. Um, and it would also be a little bit like small villages um, without corridors. There's no, you know, typical schools have these long corridors. We wanted every classroom and every, every kind of activity space to be its own space, um, sort of arranged in such a way that between, between those rooms it would be more considered a public space, not unlike maybe a space like this, rather than a corridor in which you would sort of get lost and, or, or kind of... Uh, you know, where you kind of walk along corridors. So, like, it was it was thought of as a bit, a little bit like a machine. You know, that all these things kind of work well together. But in the b in between the spaces was just as important, if not more. Um, and so the whole school was sort of arranged around these these sort of series sequences of circles. Uh, you know, where the in between space was becoming a kind of public, casual meeting meeting uh, ground for students and, and teachers and parents. Um, so anyway, un unfortunately, that project got s did not uh, go further. But what, what, what we also wanted to make sure, you know, we wanted sort of extreme transparency. So all the walls were made out of glass. Um, and one would sort of divide the, the uh, classrooms with, with curtains, which is um, an idea that we were able to, to execute in the project. I'll show it a bit later in the museum in, in New York uh, that we just finished uh, a couple of months ago. This is the overall model of the massing of the school. So the idea was the school itself would be kind of a landscape embedded into the site, which is sort of just outside of Moscow, um, you know, with all these sports facilities and and uh, um, and here you see the the kind of you know the nature of these glass cl classrooms. So like the, you know, if you wanted visual control, you would work with curtains, would be you know flexible could open it up or you can close it according to to um, um, to the, you know what, what would be required uh, it's a project we did in New York so this is not neither hot nor cold it's sort of somewhere in between uh, IBM Atelier is a museum uh, of art and technology it was a competition that we were one of the f f uh, last three finalists project was never built was also stopped by by a, a previous economic crisis, you know, the, the, the collapse of the kind of internet craze. Uh, uh, this is in, in Chelsea, in New York. Um, the, the idea of the scale of this building and the kind of division of the building is comes from the neighborhood of Chelsea, has all these two, three-story buildings, no more. They're, you know, the typical buildings are all very low. But the zoning allowed the client to propose a very tall building. So we wanted to we wanted it to read like a series of ateliers that are kind of stacked up on top of each other, with um, you know visual connections from one floor to the next, so visitors and artists could sort of see uh, what's happening in the different studios on the different floors. Um, this is what it you know what it would look like from the street. Um, the, this this building um, is sort of the first building where we really intensely looked at technology and how, it, how technology could be integrated into, into architecture uh, as a kind of um, um, as a kind of mediator between virtual and physical realities, between f virtual visitors and physical vi visitors. So we, you know, we developed this, this kind of x-ray diagram of what would happen and how things are uh, uh, electronically or physically connected. Uh, you know whether these are kind of video cameras that that um, that up, that um, self-directed uh, go into areas with most activity, so that you know the camera searches for the most active places and records those and and, and displays those uh, events in the in the lobby, or whether this is a floor that records people's footprints um, uh, and reveals uh, uh, possibly artists' work or just reveals the fact that somebody walked there 10 minutes ago, or whether the same floor records somebody being on the uh, website of the museum navigating 
uh, and surfing the web and the kind of combination of both would kind of indicate the presence of physical and virtual communities at the same in the same space or a space that um, can be used as a, a kind of impromptu theater at some time and other times it's an kind of lobby event space and at, at other times it may be a stair or ramp into a lower restaurant um, or you know the floor of the restaurant itself so this kind of idea of conver convertible space uh, with uh, integration of, of digital interactive technologies as a, as a kind of uh, new sort of activator of, of, um, of, a, of a museum space. Um, I'll show you a short animation of how we, we initially thought of the facade as a, a facade that would, that would actually display activities in the, in the museum. This is a facade where the, it's an electronic ink where the, where the um, circuitry of the electronics is printed directly on the glass and acts like a low resolution video screen. Um, so where you know even a skateboarder skateboarding up on the ground floor facade activates the entire building. Um, this museum also had a kind of research uh, division for video games, um, you know, which we then thought you could with your cell phone call in the museum and play a video game directly on the building's facade against somebody you, whom you wouldn't know who, the, who that person is. Um, so this was this project is about uh, a little over ten years old. Uh, some of these ideas sort of are today possible. I think back then they felt like they were maybe uh, sort of unachievable. Here's a video of the sa same project a little bit a stage later, where we proposed a robotic garden. Again, this robot could be controlled anywhere from you know from anywhere in the world through through uh, your, your laptop or cell phone. Um, uh, so where you plant a plant on the roof in New York and the robot would remind you that you'd have to water this plant. So it kind of in, it, it ropes you into dealing with this building that you have a little you know, f plant somewhere. A robotic archive that, that um, you, know, you could uh, have sort of you know, books retrieved for you um, and, and kind of elevator uh, that has a video wall announcing people in the elevator. So therefore, as a visitor, you become momentarily part of the a art exhibition. Um, and there you see at the bottom, you see this, this convertible lobby or this hydraulic floor. And you see that video scanner on the upper left that scans in the building the, the different events. So if there's an opening somewhere on the fifth floor, you will, the camera will go there and will display what's happening there. So unfortunately, this project did not was not um, executed, um, but it sort of provided a lot of material for further th thinking in in terms of technology and uh, and, and, and architecture and how new technologies can be integrated into architecture. We um, let me just finish this video. Okay, um, we were then like. You know, years later, we were asked by the mayor of London to, to participate in a limited competition for an iconic structure for the Olympic uh, Games in London in 2012, uh, which we didn't, um, we, we did not get this commission. This project is called the Floating Lake. Uh, we proposed uh, this sort of, um, it's kind of a folly, it's sort of a little bit of a useless structure. It was meant to be really kind of iconic and sim symbolic for the London Games. So we, pre we be pro um, 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 proposed this kind of one inch deep lake on top of the structure with a cafe and so on and, and, a, and a waterfall along the edge uh, because you, you know, you'd have a fantastic view. If you elevate it, this is this Olympic Stadium. Uh, you, know, you have a f an amazing view over the city of London. So we thought this would be important to actually you know, be up there and have this sort of incredible view and use it as a kind of kids playground. So kids could play up there and there's this waterfall on the edge and the, you know, the waterfall sort of um, is, is around the edge and the waterfall is digitally controlled. So you have underneath this structure, you have um, a, a performing performance space where you know, concerts can take place and, and um, you know, so activities which are covered from rain, obviously. 
Um, and the waterfall, we wanted to make this the, the kind of infamous London Wayne into an iconic structure. So the waterfall can be digitally controlled, um, which sort of would, could potentially look like something like this. I mean, you can write text in the, with, with water. Uh, you can, you know, you can have run patterns with water. Uh, and what would happen is when you approach, when you approach the underside, uh, the, the, the water fall would automatically stop and let you through and then start again behind you. So you wouldn't actually get wet when you get in there. Um, you know, it's like you can, uh, um, um, so, you know, the idea was that this, the, the, the kind of London rain would become really uh, the kind of event of, of, uh, of this iconic structure. Um, a project which was also, uh, it's kind of funny, I'm showing quite a few projects where like, they were kind of handicapped by economic crises and economic meltdown. This, this is a very funny project where we were asked to design a house for a client who was quite ambitious um, in up, up a little bit north, about an hour north of New York City along the Hudson River, very beautiful site. And when we first started, uh, um, you know, th there was this kind of, this, this the spot with this kind of hole in the ground. He said this is where he wanted the house. He had already started digging the foundation before he, he even hired us. Um, and so we were trying to work with this, with this, with this hole in the ground. And um, um, what was really important for him that every room had a kind of special, special view. The problem only was he could never quite decide which is the best view. So we started designing, you know, like many versions where every room was kind of oriented in a different direction. Um, until we kind of ended up with uh, hundreds of these models um, to the point where eventually uh, uh, the economic crisis, so we came up with this model and then of course the, melt the economic meltdown forced uh, him to cut the project in half and he said he didn't want to stop, he wanted to have a, a building now that was much, much smaller. So we, rest we restarted um, the design and you see this, this kind of bridge over the gap we decided we'd do a single story um, uh, building, but it would be kind of leaning over this sort of uneven site and everything was sort of um, um, oriented around the fact that the site is kind of slightly tilting uh, and also the fact that actually the economic, the, the kind of um, um, energy code in, in New York State, which I think is kind of similar to here, required us to have 50% of the building not glass. So we, we decided exactly, you know, the 50% would be solid, the other 50% would be glass. Um, and uh, uh, we sort of designed this, this, this building. The problem was eventually the project stopped because um, uh, the client, um, he, he fell in love with his bulldozer and he kept changing the site. So every time we were ready to start construction, his site was different. And uh, eventually he ran out of money I spent it all on bulldozing and could never f sort of finish <laughs> finish the building, <laughs> which is sort of like kind of sad, but uh, um, um, but but true. Uh, so the, you know this kind of large frame, this was kind of the main the main view across everything was sort of glass, but there was kind of one fr one frame which was like a big sliding door overlooking the river. But anyway. Um, also in New York, a project we just finished uh, about six months ago, Museum of the Moving Image, which is in addition to an existing building. Uh, this is the facade um, on the on the back side, so to speak. It's like a, there's a garden, a courtyard side. The front is the, an existing building that is this is um, uh, protected, uh, historically protected. It's not a particularly beautiful building, but there's very little we can do to, we could do to it. If you take the facade off, this is more or less the program. You have a theater, um, you have the, the main lobby with a cafe, you have a and student, what is called the student orientation space, where student, we separated the student entrance from the, from the general public to manage the large groups of students coming in. You have a video um, a screening space that is a gallery uh, that is specifically designed for, for video and, 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 and kind of moving image, imagery not film, not static images. Um, there is a, a, um, a, a, a temporary exhibition space and a collection storage. Uh, so this is, the f this is the front of the building uh, where the only thing we could do is you know, introduce some light and introduce these kind of 
the, the, the main entrance, this sort of pink, sort of semi-mirrored glass, which is a special glass that is sort of you, you can see through partially, and it's, it's partially mirrored. It's a bit hard to see here right now. So this triangular pattern, um, uh, and um, um, so this is the only thing we could do in the front. We made this glass, you know, uh, super flush with the with the rest of the building. Uh, uh, which is which made it quite prominently visible, even though it's a fairly minimal um, uh, structure. And then here you see the scene between the existing building and the new building, uh, where the new building is a facade that is made entirely out of basically rain gutters. This is a grid of rain gutters uh, with aluminum panels. Uh, we we wanted to avoid using caulking, so the panels all float. We also wanted it to be to appear uh, uh, kind of ephemerally thin, like a really like paper thin. This is a museum for film and, and media. Um, we wanted this sort of electronic or digital kind of appearance of it. Uh, uh, so these panels are, what, what we learned was kind of funny when you use triangular panels, the geometry is incredibly unforgiving. Um, so the, the kind of accuracy of over this, over this uh, about, um, the building is about 70 meters long it had to be that the, the, the construction tolerance had to be about two millimeters. No, no, you know, usually it's like two, three centimeters or something. So we could not have a, a tolerance of more than two millimeters, which was sort of, I don't quite know how the contractors achieved that, but, but they did. So you see that the, the panels are, the joints are all open and the panels, they're, they're a little bit like a spaceship. They have an incredible crispness and sharpness because there's no, no caulking. Um, which makes the the building kind of um, uh, uh, quite f uh, stand out in from from its context. Also, the the, the color of the building we picked this sort of sky, very light sky blue, uh, with a certain reflectivity, which makes the f the building at certain times complete completely disappear, and all you see is basically this kind of grid, this sort of three, this, this triangular uh, digital grid, um, and the only windows we have is on, on the ground floor. Um, and you'll see when we go inside, I'll show you some images inside, this kind of leaning of the glass, which has a certain very low reflectivity value, but it makes it appear as if the floor folds up or down, depending on which side you stand. Um, here you see some of this kind of, you know, the, the basic geometry of the fa facade is really flat with cuts and folds, so very simple kind of geometric uh, um, uh, manipulation. And then sort of the, the interior lobby, so you know the this sort of this sort of uh, the front door from the inside. The idea is that you actually break. The, you know this the the, the 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 name of the museum is is the door itself, is the front facade. And as you enter, you break the, the this kind of silver screen. You're entering through a kind of symbolic movie screen into the space. Uh, and then you know inside it's it is uh, primarily it's a very minimal and very sort of light colored. Um, they're kind of different. This is the, the museum store and so on. Uh, uh, and until you come to the actual theater, uh, which has a very, very strong blue color, and this is uh, there's a smaller second theater, which has a very strong kind of hot pink color, um, which are the kind of tr tr uh, uh, transitional colors that um, I'll, I'll show you in, in a minute. Uh, that are meant to kind of disorient to you to some degree before you actually enter the world of movies um, um, and, and film. The floor itself, you can actually see this here, the floor is a very light blue. It has this kind of very pale um, um, digital color, uh, which, which mo at, first, at first it appears as, as, as if it is white, but you, uh, over time you realize the floor is actually not white at all. So you begin to, s to understand the subtlety of color by having sort of these very minimal differences between, between white um, uh, and, and some of the color. And then of course this very strong blue color and when you enter the theater you're in this sort of Eve Klein blue which is um, um, we, we picked this color because it, is, it produces a certain kind of disorientation of space um, we have also the, the theater itself you can see on the edges it's the, the seat is actually higher than the theater and it's the kind of floating which again gives you the sense of kind of, you know, of certain otherworldliness before you you know before you enter the world of movies we wanted to really sort of pull you away from, from the kind of, you know, reality of everyday, uh, uh, you know, sort of environments. And, and so the theater itself, the, this, is the, this is the curtain, which has this very dynamic sort of image. Um, um, 
uh, as if you're kind of moving. It's, it's this is a little bit like a spaceship. And, and incidentally, the first movie that was screened there is Stanley Kubrick's uh, um, um, Space Odyssey 2001. And, and, and it's when you watch this movie in this theater, you feel like you're actually in the spaceship of, of this film. You know, these panels obviously are acoustic panels. Um, they're made out of a kind of heat uh, vacuum formed airplane plastic um, uh, with insulation material and they're, and they're covered with felt, with woven felt. Um, this is sort of what the, the stage and curtain looks like. And as you then leave, you know, uh, uh, after after the you know, film is over, you leave this theater, you, know, you, c you come from this sort of intense blue in this completely you know, minimal white space. And then there's a, s a smaller theater which we ha where, where the color is like this in intense hot pink. So for the similar effect, um, it's sort of when you walk in there, you, know, you look at your hand, it starts to sort of glow almost that intense. Also this idea of, of a complete um, transition from, a from, from this basically from the street or from the museum into the, into the world of film. And the you know the video screening gallery, you know, the stairs to the to the um, upstairs exhibition space. And here is you know what I mentioned earlier: the curtains that that provide uh, classrooms at times um, when you know when they have uh, during the day the museum has uh, uh, school groups coming in, and at, at, at other times the curtains can be removed uh, and and provide a kind of. Mm, a multi-event, uh, kind of flexible event space. And this is sort of, you know, the curtain image. Um, now to some projects we did in, in United Arab Emirates, the hot climate. Uh, we did a couple of experimental projects or conceptual projects for developers, which n never really, uh, again, for the same economic crisis, they never really uh, materialized. Um, we started with you know project where we were asked to design a town of 30 towers or 50 towers or something like that, uh, kind of medium rise towers. Um, and the question is like, how do you build all these towers where you don't look into somebody else's window um, and where they don't all look the same? So we started with these sort of ideas of different kind of levels and di uh, different orientations so that every tower would have pot potentially a kind of different um, uh, Height, you know, so like when you, you, you never write in the same eye level with, with anybody else. We also um, we were asked to come up with some kind of contemporary version of an Islamic pattern. So we used, you know, a kind of very conventional Islamic pattern, but we kind of diverted it through treating it differently with waterways and and, and planting. And, and here you can see the sort of organization of the these red, these red funny things are actually the different towers in there. Uh, and and the kind of floor plates, how the towers would develop, how every every floor plate would be different, even though you were using the same elevator, the same stair, and the same structure. Um, and this was some of those, you know, what those potentially would look like. Um, that it's sort of every tower would have a kind of different orientation and different configuration, uh, and you know, and, and, and sort of different interiors even. So one would be kind of metallic and shiny, and other ones one other ones would be more like you know stone material or whatever. Um, we took this further. This project never, you know, went went anywhere. But um, we took it further to another sort of project that also didn't go anywhere, other than through the kind of conceptual phase, which was of a larger project where um, we were asked to to uh, develop a, a residential building that could potentially be a hotel. It could be um, lots of small apartments, or it could be lots lots of larger apartments. So we developed this this. Um, uh, an idea of like a zipper where we could have different kind of um, programs aligned on this line and then wrap it around a kind of geometry that would more or less fill the, the zoning envelope um, and allow for, you know, um, different apartments to be basically plugged in and every apartment to be uh, um, conceptually different. And um, whether this would be a hotel or an apartment building, it would be both um, um, could be developed if the you know, if the decision would be made during construction to, to change strategies. Um, um, and the, another kind of study we did was like the idea of having private houses stacked up with large uh, gardens, uh, what this would look like in, in, a, you know, in a very, very large sort of basically a, commu a vertical community. 
uh, so where, where you know you have um, these these cuts are gardens uh, and the rest is basically more or less as an individual private house we then for a different developer were asked to design a hotel it was a competition that we won um, in, in Abu Dhabi uh, it's a site that is right directly next to the bridge by Zaha Hadid which is in this in this circle there um, and we wanted to de develop a hotel that was more like a street um, because hotels typically when you're from floor to floor you never know you, you know it's like it's, it's very anonymous and you feel like there's a corridor and you don't know anybody else and then you can t take the elevator down to the to a, to a cafe or to a kind of shop or something so we wanted this idea more it's sort of like a street um, that you you can walk up or you can walk down and you come to the different um, um, possible events uh, uh, lounges cafes shops to the to the spa to the swimming pool to the restaurant and so on so so we, we started with this idea that it's uh, it's basically spiral it's sort of like the Guggenheim Museum and there were um, sometimes this is sort of pulled out and it becomes a you know either the the larger suites or it becomes a kind of um, the the spa or it becomes a kind of business section or it becomes a restaurant so the 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 spiraling unlike the Guggenheim would be completely irregular um, be because the events would constantly change so we had this eventually these three different zones from the bottom the bi the business conference area then this spa lab pool area and the dining room dining and pool and bar on top so there were the kind of main dif differences between the sort of otherwise spiraling uh, a hotel and it would sort of end up more or less like this um, we designed a the parking garage that's underwater so you would have your expensive Ferrari driven by 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 the doorman you know and you think he's driving into the ocean because you, you know you can't quite see where he's going um, um, the idea that you know that uh, the parking would happen uh, you know uh, uh, in the under underwater and then so like this is more or less the kind of arrangement of these different plants and and this in the section what it would look like this sort of irregularity um, you know the the, the 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 lobby or the business suites up and you know, as you go further up you come to the regular hotel rooms uh, we also wanted this the the restaurant to be right on the water and the problem is in Abu Dhabi in in the summer it's so hot that you don't really want to sit on the water so we we, we developed this idea of a glass curtain that would be able to enclose uh, the waterfront which could then be air conditioned this is sort of this irregular atrium that uh, you know that kind of the, the, the ramping ramping up uh, the, the the kind of gym with a running track and a small lap pool in the middle of the lap pool and underneath here is a lounge with the, with the VIP rooms and when you sit in the lounge um, the lap pool is actually visible underneath you know you see people swimming in the lap pool so instead of sharks and kind of funny fish, you see your, you know, your co-hotel inhabitants swimming in there, which is, you know, maybe not necessarily always the prettiest sight, but um, um, it was kind of important for us to to face reality uh, in terms of, you know, what it is you're looking at um, to be a bit sort of provocative. And this would be the, the roof garden with a with this with a swimming pool which had a glass bottom. Which is also kind of a funny thing. It's actually kind of very scary to be, even though it's not a particularly tall building, but but nine, ten stories is enough to feel kind of strange to jump in a pool that has where you can see all the way down. Um, these are the rooms themselves, and um, this is this is sort of what this would look like. You see the glass bottom pool on the upper left there. Um, now to a project that we're currently building in, in, in yeah, I should, um, we're not supposed to say where it is and we're not supposed to say whom it is for so they, you know so I kind of it's like this kind of typically have these black bars over somebody's eyes we have a black bar over. Um, it's a it's a competition we want it's a very funny project um, um, that sort of developed that's we were asked to design a um, uh, a greenhouse in the desert and um, um, it was not so clear whom it was for, and it wasn't. Uh, we were given no sight. It was sort of. Uh, we were supposed to assume it was sort of in a in a in a you know in the desert somewhere. But it turned out it was obviously not in the desert. It was. Um, uh, it, it was for the the most important person in the uh, in the United Arab Emirates, 
uh, on his sort of private uh, property, um, and uh, it contains three different climate zones, um, a, a, a tropical, a Mediterranean, and a kind of general climate zone. Uh, in the general climate zone, the, p the, f the problem is um, that it has to have an artificial winter because apple trees uh, and pear trees don't bear fruit when it's not um, cold. Um, um, and this kind of, which is maybe for us here, the, the most normal trees and the most normal plants, but um, in, in the Middle East, it is um, uh, the most exotic one. And, that, and it's the most difficult climate to achieve in, a, in an environment that is, that is sort of 45 degrees or hotter in, in, in summer. Um, so this, this is sort of an, a huge challenge for, for us and the engineers to, to create um, this, these, these sort of artificial climates um, uh, in a building that is, this is basically just being driven, just being kind of um, um, navigated by golf carts. So it's, just, it's kind of very strange. So like we designed these sort of ramps. This is like an earlier version of, of a ramping system. Uh, and and this is a kind of roof, the, roo the roof landscape with an occupiable central roof because uh, His Highness uh, wants to be able to go up on the roof, but at the same time, there are certain restrictions for you know, gender separated, so men are not allo allowed to look into certain directions over the palaces, and women are, and so men have to be a little bit lower than women, and it's a kind of complicated, and they can't be in the same space at the same time. Um, so we, you know, we, we kind of, this is like a seri series of plans. We learned a lot about um, the kind of uh, uh, Muslim culture and, and um, sort of how, how, you know, gender relations work. So you have a women's uh, uh, space and a men's space. They, you know, they're very sort of carefully calibrated. Um, and uh, it, it the orange is a kind of primary circulation space through these greenhouses. This is sort of what the, the glass roof looks like. We have a kind of uh, a carefully calibrated topography. We didn't want the greenhouse to just be like a flat, you know, farm. And it's like the greenhouse is, is, is turned out to be the wrong terminology. It's really more like a, a, a biosphere with a, with a kind of landscaped um, um, uh, topography uh, that that creates interesting sort of climate condition between the low roof and the high roof. Which which help the engineers to kind of get the, the air circulating and helps to minimize excessive heat and um, um, which is sort of the biggest problem in this in this um, in this building. Um, this is sort of more or less what it what it sort of looks like, where we have this kind of landscaped um, um, uh, you know these landscaped gardens. This is this is um, um, this is about I think fifteen thousand square meters of roof surface. So this fairly large uh, structure, and we we um, broke ground about um, two three months ago or so. Um, another project we're currently working on, which is also very large, and it's this is a you know this is strange because we have a lot of very funny projects. This is one of the funny projects where we were asked by the owner of this, um, it's a kind of shopping, uh, retail, and cultural complex. The site is on the right, and we were asked um, by the owner to design this building after they started building the columns already in the foundation. So you see this thing is under construction, and they've given us more or less uh, about a meter of, of play in the facade. Every, every time we went a little bit too close, they they worried about losing um, rentable square feet, and if you go out too far, we can't do because of the uh, building codes. Um, so we have about a meter thickness uh, to play with, um, which is sort of which is very limiting, obviously. Um, and this inc extremely large building, um, and we you know and, and the client wanted they were inspired by our Helix Hotel, and they wanted something of that sort. So we kind of started studying these. Uh, iterations of, of spiraling and and we managed to um, convince the client to do at least half of the building which is the upper half as a ramp you know 
Uh, so like it's a it's a shopping mall where the top part is ramp and the, the the bottom part is sort of conventional flat floors, which of course now you won't be able to tell. It's sort of all it's all basically kind of one sort of uh, um, uh, ribbon that sort of irregular ribbon that r that wraps up there. Um, and in order to convince the client to that we would build the ramp, she said, "Okay, we'll we'll." We'll try out the ramp, the slope, and overnight she had this this ramp built in front of her house, and um, and of course you know we had to try it with a wheelchair, uh, and to convince the client that this was doable. You know, it's it's I mean it's 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 great to have a client who is the sort of proactive and and you know can can uh, 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 do something like this, but it's also very um, difficult to you know to uh, uh, to to have to go through this at the same time. Um, anyway, so this this is about the size of the project. These towers are exist. This is existing. This is this is not our tower. This this background tower, but um, this is also an existing mall, which is integrated into this. Uh, uh, and this primary piece is is this this building with this sort of upper ramp, uh, where there's also an, an, a garden in the middle of the building on the f on the fifth floor, which is actually literally the seventh floor. Uh, is this garden? The, this whole mall is connected to the to uh, the city subway, an elevated subway train, which is the main street in Bangkok. Uh, we're working on these movie theaters, and you know, it's sort of like a very uh, complex building that's constantly in flux. I mean, we're again, the construction has started, but we haven't finished designing designing it yet. Um, so these images are kind of preliminary images of where we are at the moment. Um, some of the elements are very sort of, uh, uh, you know, they, they I guess a mall in Bangkok has to have this, like this garden in the back, this kind of waterfall, which is not my favorite part. But um, you see, you see here, you know, that uh, this this kind of green hanging over the edges. This is something the client is insisting on. Um, but what what I think is kind of very promising is this garden in the middle. is sort of cutting this building open, pulling it apart, and pushing this garden in, which. Um, uh, uh it's a kind of reference to the idea in these projects we did in uh, these this residential projects we did in in, in Dubai, uh, which never got built. Um, so this is what this garden, you know, may look like without without the floors above, and you know, the, and, and kind of developing some, trying to push this mall a little bit away from the from the traditional malls, which is very very difficult to do because the commercial requirements are pretty stringent and tough. Um, and this is sort of uh, you have this kind of this bar on top with this, with this infinity pool, um, you know, which is, which is, I guess, a mall must has to have. Okay, so like now, what I in the beginning, what I mentioned that um, the reason why I'm here in Moscow is uh, that we were just invited to um, participate in a competition for the Polytechnic Museum. So, like, uh, my office is one of four competitors, um, which is a fantastic project and I've been basically I've been here now for three days and day and night sort of walking through this building and I'm trying to make to make sense out of this building um, that has been of course over the over the you know years had been sort of modified and changed and it's an amazing project um, I don't know whether you've been in there but I can only recommend you to go inside because the the, the, the material inside is, is, is quite mind-blowing um, which is a project we're, we're going to be uh, working the next for the next months on and um, I will be back here in a month and I think for now this is probably enough before it starts raining thank you very much <laughs> I guess if you have questions I'm happy to answer them thanks uh, how big are the three biospheres that you have thought about how big are they what's the surface the build, the build, the build project. Yes. Um, the museum in New York is about. Uh, uh, no, uh, I'm now I'm in interested in uh, three biospheres, uh, uh, three, like three climate. The, their, the surface of them is about fifteen thousand square meters. The three of them together. So I, I, I don't know exactly the di diameter of, the, of each of these circles, but um, the fifteen thousand square meter, you know, area is is the building. What a design just for walking or? Uh for f it's the, well, the des design is um, the reason for this building is it's for the royal family. It's basically when a state visitor comes to the United Arab mm. Emirates, 
he'll be brought into this building and they'll be given some fruit that they actually grow in there as a kind of you know gift of the of the sheikh of the emirates um, they drive around a golf cart and that's it and they but they also do um, education they bring school children in and, and educate them about about biology i guess so that's a kind of two purposes. So one one is an official purpose, and the other one is an educational purpose. Uh, and did you plan some uh, water there, like rivers, lakes? There is there is the water feature in there. Yes, there's the small waterfalls. Like you know, there's also wa a hydroponic garden in there. So like you know, plants that grow only with water. Mm -hmm. I have a small question about this uh, image museum. Can you give some, uh, tell how you collaborate, because I know that you collaborate there with some graphic designers from New York, why these guys, uh, very strange name, I don't remember exactly. Carlson Wilka. Yeah, exactly. Yes. But can you tell more about the collaboration with them and how it happened? How this happened? Um, it happened, we had, uh, we, had a, we had a few other graphic designers initially involved in the project and we somehow never quite, it never quite worked and uh, um, the client, the director of the museum, it's actually a museum of the city of New York, it's a public museum. The director of the museum at some point came across these graphic designers which are um, uh, two young uh, gentlemen, from one from, from uh, Iceland, the other one from Germany, uh, who, who are very, um, they do very interesting, unconventional work and we were immediately, you know, interested and fascinated and, um, um, you know, in the collab we started collaboration, and they did um, the the whole, you know, the graphic package for the museum as well. So, like, what's on the internet, you can visit the internet. So they, they designed the entire internet environment. Uh, they designed the typeface, um, uh, you know, and they designed the, they designed almost everything that the museum store is selling: T-shirts and you know stuff like that. Um, it was a very interesting collaboration. I'm still thinking it's going to start raining any second. Do you have a question? Or do you want to use this? Could you tell us uh, what kind of changes uh, will you expect with this Polytechnic Museum? Uh, Polytechnic Museum in Moscow. What kind of changes? What kind of? Changes. Changes uh, to, the, to the museum? Uh, I. I, I well, let me put it this way. I can't say that yet because I'm just, this is now the first time I visited the museum. Um, but the museum has big ambitions to, um, um, in, the, in the competition brief, what they're saying is they want to become one of the 10 most important museums in the world, which is, you know, very uh, ambitious. Um, and they want to, um, um, they want the museum to be more of a public space a space where people can meet, uh, you know, where people go to, to you know, to, to public events, lectures, and uh, rather than a kind of enclosed museum where you only go look at objects. They want to be more educational and more social. Um, and I think, uh, um, on I think the goals of being one of the 10 most important museums in the world makes it also one of the maybe most visible museums in Moscow in a certain way, or most important museums in, in Moscow. Um, so like it, right now, uh, people come to Moscow and they don't know about this museum, they don't go there. Um, the idea is to change it to the point that you come to Moscow and this is a must-see site. You go to the Kremlin and you go to the Kremlin. You know, so that's sort of the... So that's sort of the idea. Well, the museum работать дальше и будем надеяться, что мы с подобным вызовом справимся. Окей. Okay. Okay. Спасибо вам большое за то, что пришли.